Today, our society leader and teacher, Hugh Taft Morales, will be speaking to us about a troubling episode in our nation's history. The US government's consignment of 120,000 innocent citizens of Japanese descent to internment camps during World War II. His talk is titled, The Japanese Have Disappeared. Hugh. Good morning. <clears throat> Let me try that again <clears throat> for my sake. <clears throat> Good morning. Get that frog out of the way. Welcome to Susquehanna Valley, folks. Glad you're with us. All right, so this is a tough, a tough historical issue. The Japanese memorial to patriotism during World War II at the intersection of Louisiana Avenue and D Street in Washington, D.C. is a small but powerful memorial. It's dedicated 23 years ago to the thousands of Japanese Americans sent to concentration camps during World War II. It reminded me of a, a beautiful, placid place to seek some calm. And in the middle of this memorial is a statue by Nina Akamu of two cranes caught in barbed wire. It reminded me of photos I've seen of birds caught in fishing nets, trapped, doomed. But some say that these cranes are not trapped and doomed, but that they're breaking free. So in that spirit, as I speak about this horrible violation of civil and human rights, I hold up the resilience, perseverance, and strength of the 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry that this monument celebrates. Now my talk is divided into three parts today. First, I'll explain some of the harm done. And then I'll explain the hysteria and racism behind that harm. And then I'm going to conclude with some efforts to learn and heal. First, though, I want to acknowledge that I cannot speak for anybody directly harmed by Japanese American removal. I also want to add that Japanese American community is diverse in many ways, socially, politically, generationally, and this brief talk cannot do justice to that diversity. Second, as a child, I want to say that I was taught the traditional false narratives about Japanese Americans humanely resettled in comfortable internment camps. But as PS member Misha Tashjian emphasized to me, Japanese Americans were imprisoned in concentration camps. Concentration camps is the term used by the person ultimately responsible for this injustice, President Roosevelt. So I'm going to use that term. Now I hope my talk will help bring out the best in ourselves and in our country. Maybe we won't make similar mistakes regarding groups unjustly targeted today, especially those seeking safety in our country. We have to be honest about our past so that we can be better in the present and future. As President Biden said on February 19th of last year, the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, which led to the incarceration, quote, today we recognize that euphemistic terms that we have collectively used in the past, such as assembly centers, relocation, or internment, do not adequately describe the injustice experienced by some 120,000 people. We recognize the forced removal of mass incarceration of Japanese Americans and others during World War II, and we affirm our commitment to Nidoto Nai Yani, which translates to let it not happen again. All right, to better understand the harm done, we have to acknowledge the anti-Asian sentiment in the United States over the years. It was in the mid-1800s that anti-American Asian, uh, anti-Asian prejudice really began to peak as immigrants settled on the west coast of our country. The gold rush meant that many came to this country and worked in dangerous pr professions like uh, railroads or in laundries or in brothels. Some became financially secure, which angered those wanting to keep the land, quote, white man's country, a phrase used often then and today. <laughs> Anti-Asian violence spiked, and this led the federal government to ban Chinese immigrants with an 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act targeting that country. But this led to labor shortages, which led to an influx of Japanese workers 
and they helped the West Coast become an agricultural powerhouse. Some workers saved up and bought their own land, which again made many resentful white farmers see them as outsiders, as competitors. So then the government passed laws prohibiting non-citizens from owning land. And resentment began to peak in the 1920s, resulting in the 1924 Immigration Act, which reduced immigration from Asia to a trickle. Now, very few Americans flourished during the depressions, but things got particularly bleak for those Japanese Americans in 1941 when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Those of Japanese ancestry were instantly framed as enemies. They were jeered, shamed, physically intimidated, and assaulted. The FBI immediately arrested over 5,000 Japanese Americans it suspected of anti-American activities in the Western states. And J. Edgar Hoover said, believed that that was sufficient. He actually thought no further action was necessary. Secretary of Interior Harold Ickes agreed, and both men defended the rights of Japanese Americans that were still free. But others convinced President Roosevelt that more had to be done. Civil rights be damned. Carl Van Densen, an Army Major of the Wartime Civil Control Administration, and General John DeWitt, head of the Army's Western Defense Command, lobbied for and carried out President Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066, which removed Japanese Americans from the West Coast. Van Densen was particularly ardent, ordering confinement of anyone of any age who, quote, had one drop of Japanese blood. DeWitt issued a freeze order which prevented early emigration from California because he wanted to totally control this population. The text of Executive Order 9066, interestingly, did not include the term Japanese, nor long-term internment, but it didn't have to because those in charge understood. The order was only applied to Japanese Americans, not to those of German or Italian descent who we were fighting in the war. And the media fueled anti-Japanese sentiments on top of that. Her Her uh, Henry McLemore, who was uh, with the Hearst newspaper uh, empire, wrote, I am for immediate removal of every Japanese on the West Coast to a point deep in the interior. I don't mean a nice part of the interior either. Let them be pinched, hurt, hungry, and dead up against it. He encouraged Americans to beware of, quote, the enemy or anyone whose veins carry his blood. Japanese Americans began destroying anything that indicating their connection to Japan. So letters and photographs were burned. Legacies went up in smoke. Families were told where to gather for removal. Allowed to bring only one suitcase, they began trying to sell their personal possessions. Neighbors generally delayed buying, realizing that desperation would drive the prices down. Many destroyed their own property rather than allowing their neighbors to profit at their expense. They lost homes, friendships, professions. Some experienced acute shame. I mean, anybody who's perp walked by the police, whether you're innocent or not, knows this shame. And as Japanese Americans gathered for removal, neighbors watched with a combination of pity, suspicion, and hate. Most Japanese Americans were first brought to holding facilities that were in racetracks or horse stables or uh, various animal enclosures and livestock pens. And the stench and the dirt and the din created a shock experience from which many never recovered. When they finally got to the long-term incarceration camps, it was clear that they were not pioneer communities that were told to the public, that was sold to the public that way. <clears throat> they were bleak. Medical care was suboptimal, and people died in these camps because of that. Eleanor Roosevelt, after she visited the Gala River camp, said, I wouldn't want to live that way, and she campaigned for an end to the detention program. The food was notoriously bad. At most, the government budgeted 50 cents per person per day. That bought things like canned Vienna sausages, dried fish, boiled vegetables, stale bread. 
The authorities said that they didn't want other Americans to think that those in the camps were being spoiled. In one particular case, the food was so bad that when people with sudden intestinal illnesses rushed to the latrine, the guards thought they were trying to escape. Quarters were cramped, and that increased a lack of privacy. In many multifamily units, the walls didn't go up to the ceilings, so the people heard everything, from arguments to lovemaking. Children and adults were paid the same low wage for their labor, which undermined traditional family hierarchies. And that particular aspect of dividing generations got worse when the U.S. offered young men the opportunity to serve in the U.S. military. And many parents disapproved. One father saying, we lose everything, the property, the business, our home. It's like a kick in the pants. And now they're saying, come in and shine my shoes. The government further divided the population using a loyalty questionnaire, and there were two particular questions that offended the Japanese Americans. Question 27 asked if they were willing to serve in the military for the U.S. Question 28 asked if they would swear unqualified allegiance to the United States and forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. Now, besides the absurdity of serving in a military for a country that's imprisoning you, Many wondered how they could possibly forswear allegiance to the emperor when they never had any allegiance to the emperor to begin with. Many who were insulted by these questions simply answered no and no. 18,000 of these individuals who were nicknamed no-nos were sent to Thule Lake Camp, which was particularly brutal where they intimidated with tanks and beatings. 300 of those prosecuted for tr being troublemakers, only one was found innocent. Some served up to three years in federal penitentiary. Some inmates were drafted into the military and then prosecuted for not serving, another absurdity. And I could go on about the harshness of this, but I want to move on to the hysteria and the racism that was behind it. So learn more. If this is new to you, learn more about this. Now, Japanese Americans were victims of war hysteria mixed with a simmering racism. Hostility flared instantly after Executive Order 9066 was issued. Leaders of the interior states heard about this, and they declared that they would not be, quote, the dumping ground for the Japanese. And they added some shocking statements, some I had to edit today, just because I thought they were too grotesque. Idaho Governor Chase Clark spewed dehumanizing rubbish, referring to the Japanese uh, with Japanese ancestry with an ethnic slur, which I will not repeat, adding that they live like rats, breed like rats, and act like rats. Clark's attorney general insisted that if Japanese were brought to Idaho, they must be kept in concentration camps because, quote, we want to keep this a white man's country. Wyoming Governor Nell Smith was probably the worst. I'm not even going to say that, uh, what he said other than to say that he threatened to murder any Japanese brought to his state. Similar racism infected the military leadership, particularly General DeWitt and Carl Van Densen. According to Richard Reeves, who wrote the book Infamy, the shocking story of the Japanese-American internment in World War II, DeWitt and Van Densen were, quote, both bigots the latter a pathological liar who drove the process grossly exaggerating the dangers posed by West Coast Japanese. General DeWitt used racist slurs and the racist trope that no person of Japanese descent could be ever trusted, declaring, quote, there is no way to determine their loyalty. That mindset was part of a, a catch-22. If the Japanese Americans went to the camps, then Americans said, ah, see, they're guilty because they're in camps. If they resisted and didn't go to the camps, Americans said, oh, there are proves that they're guilty. Not a single Japanese American was ever convicted of sabotage. And DeWitt argued that that proved just how sneaky they were because they could hide the sabotage. The absence of sabotage was used as proof of guilt. For DeWitt, Japanese Americans could never be trusted because, quote, the racial strains are undiluted. Now, a report that DeWitt produced in 1943 defending the concentration camps was full of this type of bigotry. 
Reviewers in the War Department, when they read it, were so shocked that they ordered the only 10 copies of the report to be destroyed. They reproduced the report without the most blatant racism, but it was full of faulty intelligence and distortion. In 1944, that report, the one that was cleaned up to a degree, was central to the Supreme Court case Korematsu versus the United States. Now, when Executive Order 9066 was issued, the 23-year-old Fred Korematsu said he found himself an enemy in his own country. He resisted evacuation orders and was arrested. Now, his case went to the Supreme Court, where the prosecutor was the Solicitor General of the United States, Charles Fahey. And he used the cleaned up version of that report to defend the Executive Order 9066, and he won the case in Korematsu by claiming that there was ship-to-shore communication that gave information about military bases and other crucial information to Japan. Fahey cited radio broadcasts between domestic spies in Japan. He knew that the FBI found no evidence of ship-to-shore communication. He knew that the FCC denied any radio contact with Japan. But nevertheless, Fahey's lies were accepted by the court. Fahey deliberately repressed a report from the Office of Naval Intelligence, which concluded that there were no Japanese spy activity, Japanese-American spy activity. Though this senior prosecutorial official in the United States knew he was lying, he vouched for, quote, every line, every word, every syllable in his claims. Korematsu was found guilty and sentenced to five years of pro, 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 probation. Now, it wasn't until the 1980s when Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga did some research. She was a senior in high school at the time, and she was in, uh, sorry, when she was a senior, she was in prison at Manzanar concentration camp. And decades later, while she was researching at the National Archives, she found one copy of the original DeWitt report full of the racism that somehow escaped being destroyed. And her research proved valuable to activists who wanted to convince the government in 1980 to create a commission on wartime relocation and internment in California, which happened. And the information that she unearthed, along with others, supported the commission work. And after 750 interviews, the commission concluded that a, quote, grave injustice had been done to 120,000 people of Japanese descent. And it was only then, in the 1980s, when most Americans became aware that no Japanese American was ever convicted of sabotage. There was no ship to shore communication, no radio communication with Japan. One of the broadcasts that the government claimed was mischief from Japan was actually a broadcast from Radio Japan, a public broadcast. The hearings concluded that in fact many Japanese Americans were, quote, hyper-patriotic to the United States. Despite suffering grave injustices, many of those incarcerated did choose to serve in the military. The commission's 493-page report in 1982 called Personal Justice Denied acknowledged that General DeWitt's justifications for removal were unfounded. And it concluded that, quote, the broad historical causes that shaped these decisions were race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. FDR failed to protect US citizens or calm hysteria towards the Japanese. He was more concerned about preventing anti-Japanese riots that might disrupt wartime agricultural and industrial production. The commission also concluded that the camps were cruel and inhumane, their words. It acknowledged that the internees were uh, suffering, suffered severe psychological and physical harm. And it cited Justice Frank Murphy, who in the Korematsu case had said that the Japanese Americans in prison, that this whole incident, quote, falls into the ugly abyss of racism and resembles the abhorrent, despicable treatment of minority groups by the dictatorial tyrannies which this nation is now pledged to destroy. In the final 1982 report, it was a long delayed acknowledgement which helped start some healing. So I want to go to that now. Now while this 1982 
report was important, many believed that some form of financial compensation was warranted and necessary for healing, right? Others feared that the compensation would create a backlash. And that was the position of Senator Hayakawa, Republican from California. Now, Hayakawa was a Japanese-American, and he supported the commission work, but he said that those in prison should not be paid for, quote, fulfilling their obligations. He even said that detention was, quote, beneficial to Japanese-Americans because it earned them praise for being patriotic. Now, that positive reputation, Hayakawa said, would disappear if any financial payment was made. President Reagan, who initially resisted compensation, did sign the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, providing monetary compensation to survivors. Now, $20,000 per person was a paltry sum for the financial harm done. According to Smithsonian Magazine, the Japanese American community lost an estimated $3.6 billion in 2022 dollars. But reparations and the admission of wrongdoing help with healing. When Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, he said, we here admit a wrong. Here we affirm our commitment to a nation, to e a commitment to, as a nation to equal justice under law. But the harm caused does not completely disappear with a stroke of a pen, which is why we have to continue teaching about this. That's why last year, President Biden proclaimed on February 19th, a day of remembrance committed to the work to, quote, eradicate systemic racism and heal generational trauma in our communities. But so many Americans don't want to remember. We see that today. There's a backlash in this country to processing this history, particularly history that has for so long been suppressed or minimized in order to maintain narratives of American exceptionalism. Many Americans still hold precious a belief that we are relatively without fault, that we are a city upon the hill, that we're an example to the world in every way. So some prefer denial to being better by embracing both our flaws and each other. Current debates about the teaching of history demonstrate this dynamic everywhere. Last, last, uh, last summer, actually, in Wisconsin, there was an incident where a couple of parents complained to the school board about Farewell to Manzanar, Manzanar a lovely book, and Julio Tsuka's When the Emperor, Emperor Was Divine. You might recall that in 2020, I discussed Otsuka's book, The Buddha in the Attic. And these books offer the perspective of those victimized by this wartime hysteria and racism. And given the fact that minorities today continue to be targeted, it's important to keep these books in the curriculum. But those critics said that the school system should provide a balanced perspective on the removal of Japanese Americans, and that these books didn't offer it. They said, what about the government's perspective? What are they talking about? <laughs> are they talking about that we should read the lines of Solicitor General Fahey, the lies that led to the conviction of Frank Korematsu? Do they mean that we should have the students dig up the original DeWitt report full of racist slurs and false information? Now maybe they mean that the horror of incarcerating tens of thousands of innocent Americans should be put into the context of other horrors around the world. Baltimore Ethical Society member Tevis Tsai remembers being, that being the approach of an elementary school teacher. When she brought up Japanese American camps, she added, but what the Nazis did was a thousand times worse, and then moved on. That was it. Of course, Nazi atrocities were awful. But this teacher minimized Japanese American internment and the harm done. Now, one of these concerned Wisconsin parents, a woman named Ann Zelke, said that students should be given, quote, an American perspective. And when it was pointed out that 100,000 of those in the camps who were violated were American, she quickly said that what she meant was that students should read about 
evil actions done by the nations of Japan, such as the rape of Nanjing or other war atrocities. What did Selkie think that had to do with Fred Korematsu and other Japanese Americans? Now, I want to hold compassion for Zelke and for other parents who fear discussing the ugly side of U.S. history. But those fears cannot marginalize the suffering experienced by Americans of Japanese descent. Suffering caused by a government and a country weaponized by racism and wartime hysteria. I believe that we as a nation can do better. That's why I agree with President Biden when he marked the 80th anniversary last year, saying, I have always believed that a great nation does not ignore the most painful moments. They confront them with honesty and in doing so learn from them and grow stronger as a result. The incarceration of Japanese Americans 80 years ago is a reminder to us today of the tragic consequences we invite when we allow racism, fear, and xenophobia to fester. Tevis Tsai shared with me a 2022 report titled Social Tracking of Asian Americans in the U.S., or Status. Now this report notes that today, attacks against Asian Americans communities continue at increasingly alarming rates. It explains that these attacks flow from a deep systemic xenophobia and a historic othering of Asian Americans. Racist comments by Trump and others blaming COVID on the Chinese deepens this intolerance. Now, frighteningly, this report indicates that Americans who think Asians are, quote, at least partially responsible for COVID climbed from 11% in 2021 to 21% in 2022. So it's only increasing this myth. Now, as I emphasized in my anti-Semitism talk, Two weeks ago, many right-wing extremists try to divide historically marginalized groups by setting them against each other. And some say that prejudice against Asians in our country is not as bad as prejudice against other minorities and that Asians, Americans, should stay quiet. But it's worth pointing out that the status report indicates that Asian Americans experience a high degree of othering. It states, Many Americans are unaware of the spike in anti-Asian American racism and hate over the past year, and that Asian Americans are least likely among all racial groups to feel we belong and are accepted in the U.S., even if born in the U.S. So as racism and xenophobia continue to plague this nation, the words of Fred Korematsu remind us how demagogues use hate and manipulate fear. In 2004, a year before he died, Kuramatsu told the San Francisco Chronicle, quote, fears and prejudice directed against minority communities are too easy to evoke and exaggerate, often to serve political agendas of those who promote those fears. No one should ever be locked away simply because they share the same race, ethnicity, or religion as a spy or a terrorist. If that principle was not learned from the internment of Japanese Americans, then these are very dangerous times for our democracy. Now, Mishi emphasized to me that my talk today is not about Japanese American history. This is American history. The historian Richard Reeves agreed, saying, this story is not about Japanese Americans, it's about Americans on both sides of the barbed wire surrounding the relocation camps, the Americans crammed into tar paper, paper barracks, and the Americans with machine guns and searchlights in watchtowers. What happened to the Japanese Americans in our, is a part of our history. Just like black history is American history, this lesson must build understanding of our shared history. History can no longer be just written by the winners. Dr. Frank Kitamoto, who was incarcerated as a child in these camps, said, this is not just a Japanese-American story, but an American story with implications for the world. When I first visited that Japanese-American memorial, I was struck by how many of, how much of it was uh, directed towards the military sacrifice of Japanese-Americans. It's incredible how many died for a country that imprisoned them because of their race. <clears throat> 
It is right and just to express gratitude for those who sacrificed everything. President Truman praised World War II veterans of Japanese ancestry, saying, you fought not only the enemy, you fought prejudice and you won. Keep up the fight and we will continue to win to make this great republic stand for what the Constitution says it stands for, the welfare of all the people, all the time. Now, the perseverance of those who survived the camps is a gift to our country. It's a gift to us today. As I mentioned earlier, I was particularly impressed by how the incarcerated fellow citizens made the most of these camps, how with tenacity and creativity, they created schools, athletic leagues, social events, and art. Eleanor Roosevelt praised the initiative of the incarcerated for growing their own food, ameliorating the heart desert climate, beautifying the camps, policing and educating themselves. They built a better life for themselves when their country abandoned them. Now interestingly, many artists scavenged small pieces of wood to carve birds. They made small sculptures out of them. In particular, they made sculptures of birds, which is a common theme in Japanese art. Many small painted birds were found in the camps as people left. This made me think differently about those cranes that were in this barbed wire, in the sculpture of the Japanese American Memorial. These birds represented the grand and noble spirit of the Japanese Americans caught up in this travesty. And it informs the work of one particular advocacy group that I put in the chat, Tsutsuru, Tsutsuru for Solidarity. Tsutsuru, sorry, Tsuru means the crane in Japanese. And the website of this group declares that they are a direct political project of Japanese American social justice advocates working to end detention sites and support frontline immigrants and refugee communities that are being targeted by racist inhumane in immigration policy policies today. They declare, we stand on the moral authority of Japanese Americans who suffered the atrocities and legacy of U.S. concentration camps during World War II, and we say, stop repeating history. Stop allowing hysteria to criminalize people from other countries, many of them coming here because it's the only place they can go for safety. So I'm going to suggest that in honor of the perseverance and sacrifice of Japanese Americans 80 plus years ago, let's do what President Biden called us, us to do last year, to uplift the courage and resilience of brave Japanese Americans who, despite being unjustly incarcerated, formed powerful communities and marshaled incredible dignity and strength. Let's help us renew our faith that together we can bring out the best in our country and we can stop repeating history. Thank you very much.